Merry Christmas uh, out there to everybody in the Delaware Valley. Uh, it's your Eagles taking a win today. This is the Pilaki Eagles post game show. Uh, the uh, this segment is brought to us by the great people at uh, Colony Pools. Sign up right now for the Colony Pools Winter Watch Program, where you can get your uh, uh, Kelly Green uh, pool cover. Uh, we'll send it right to you. Go to uh, colonypools.com uh, for that. Uh, Seth, let's pick up on your uh, uh, opinion on uh, Nick Sirianni and what he's not giving to this team right now. So we and we haven't. You're right. We haven't really focused a lot on the head coach, and that's kind of odd because we always focus on a head coach's fallacies in this town, especially when it comes to Eagle football. So uh, what is he doing right now? Is he, is he, does he not have control of this situation in your opinion? I don't think it's a situation where he doesn't have control. I believe that the players respect Nick, you know, I, and I believe they play for him. I just think that there are some things, you know, sometimes as a coach, the season gets so long and there's so much going on and there's so much, you know, on your plate. You know, you have to be a head coach has to be on top of everything. And I, I understand why he passed on, you know, calling plays, because it, if you're going to be an offensive play caller, then you better have a defensive guy that's running your defense. That's pretty much just, you know, he's in control of that. You know, the only the only time you have anything to say to him is in a situation where, you know, you're thinking about blitzing, and he hears it in his he his headset because the head coach is cued into everybody. He can switch over to the defensive side of the ball. He can switch over to the offensive side of the ball. He can hear everybody, you know. So the only time that he's got a say or he's got something to say about what you're doing on the defensive side of the ball is in critical situations, decisions that you're going to make that are critical to the game. So when I'm looking at Nick, you know, and I've seen it happen before with great head coaches, you know, later in their career, you know, you start losing control of the entire picture from the standpoint. And I'm not saying in, a, in, in any kind of way that Nick has lost control of his football team, but sometimes the little small things, the little details begin to slip. Things begin to fall through the cracks and coaches are notorious for saying, you know, pay attention to the details, pay attention to the small things. Don't let, you know, make sure you, you know, you don't leave a single stone unturned in your preparation. And what happens is as a head coach, when you let some things start to slip, like last week, Jalen Hurts started talking about the commitment. You've heard him talk about the details. You've heard Nick Sirianni talk about the details. You know, you heard Jalen Hurts last week, you know, mention, you know, you play like you practice. That tells me that there's some things that's going on internally, you know, from a practice standpoint, from a fundamentals and a technique standpoint, um, little small details that head coaches don't let slip that are begin that, that are slipping. Because when you continue to make the same mistakes over and over and over and over again, you're not being reprimanded for that. You're not being held accountable for that. You know, and I got into it, you know, with a guy on Twitter this week about the whole, you know, um, you know, holding players and holding people accountable, you know, and I'm the type of person that, you know, I grew up in that era of, you know, of just tough love and show me a player. And I've always said, show me a player that wants to be great. And I'll show you a player that doesn't mind being coached hard. I show, show me a player that I'll show. And that's a player who doesn't mind being held accountable. You know, now I lived in that era where it was way over the top. A guy like me, it didn't bother me because I was mentally strong. You could talk about me, you know, to the media. That's what Buddy Ryan did. He didn't wait to his Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday press conference. He talked about you right in the moment, right after the game was over. Oh, 59 played like, you know, you know what I'm saying? He didn't care, you know. But for me, it didn't bother me because for me, I knew that there was a message that he was trying to send me. So I learned how to take what I needed to take even as a young player, as a 20-year-old starting my first year, take what I needed to take. And the, and the BS, I let it go out the other ear, you know. But now we live in an era where you can't hold these guys accountable like this anymore. You know, Chip Kelly just ruined it all for this organization because now it's all about emotional intelligence. And I believe that when you make massive adjustments, sometimes it goes too far in the other direction. And I get the sense that that's where we are, where we can't hold guys accountable. 
when you hear Darius Slay say some of the things that he said over the last three weeks, come on, man. You got the C right here, brother. You don't make those kind of comments. You don't say those types of things. You know, and where is the coaching staff to call him and check him on that kind of stuff? When you start hearing rumblings, you know, from players and people within the organization that are making innuendos and they don't want to, they don't want to sign their name to it. You know, they want to write a check that their ass can't cash, but they don't want to write their name on it. Okay. That's problematic for me because it's all it all comes down to accountability. And it all, all comes down to an organization that's not willing to accept certain things and a coaching staff that's not willing to accept certain things. So when you talk about the question you asked me, I don't think there's ever a situation where Nick Sirianni is losing his football team. But I do believe when I'm watching them play and I watch some of the things that happen and some of the things that I hear that comes out of that should be stay behind closed doors, I believe that people aren't being held accountable the way that they need to. That's my opinion. Seth, to go back, right before the break, you mentioned the three and the third and one where they handed the ball in the shotgun nonetheless. Handed the ball in the shotgun to DeAndre Swift. Do you think that was Sirianni's play call or do you think that was Brian Johnson's play call? If Brian Johnson called it, Nick Sirianni was okay with it. Because okay. if, if Nick Sirianni called it, I mean, if Brian Johnson called it, Nick Sirianni heard it. You understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. There's a conversation that's going on between, you know, Nick Sirianni and Brian Johnson. It's Nick Sirianni's offense. He says that every single week. Right. Okay? So, but he also says Brian Johnson calls the plays. Yeah, Brian calls the plays, but Nick has the ability to override it. It's like I would hope. Brian, yeah. Listen, they could get up to the line in fourth and five, and and Brian, you know, says, you know, barks out a call. He's talking to Jalen. It's you know, twenty five seconds on on the clock. You know, and Nick would be like, "Are you out your damn mind? We play." <laughs> You you understand what I'm saying? I, I hope so, that's the case, but that seems like a lot of conversation while the while the clock's ticking. Well, you're 100 right, but that's the kind of conversation that goes on. Okay. And when it comes when it comes to play calling, too, you're not just calling plays one at a time. Great play calling means that you're almost three three play three calls ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I'm if it's first down, you know, I've, I've I've in a lot of ways I've already thought about on second and third down what I'm actually going to run. Uh -huh. You know, when you see clocks running down. That's a pure indication to me as a player, having been there and done that before, that they weren't prepared for what they really wanted to call. Okay. So, right. That's a great sec. That's a great point. It was third and one. You had just given up a fumble on a kickoff right out of halftime where you're looking to build momentum and put this, put the Giants away. And, and you need to maintain possession. And you need to make that. There is no more obvious call to me. Then a third and one, tush push, keep the drive, and make sure the drive keeps going in that exact moment. And if you're Nick Sirianni and you hear the play come across, whoa, whoa, how is there anything other than tush push here? Did they already feel like they, they abused it at that point in the game? I, it just makes zero sense to me that they wouldn't go to it. It reminded me of Chip Kelly because time and time again, we would see Chip Kelly and as emotionally unintelligent as he might've been, he would continue to compound that by running, you know, out of the shotgun on third and inches, because for whatever reason, that was the best play you could call at that moment, according to him. And then we saw from Brian Johnson and Nick Sirianni today, it doesn't make any sense to me. And, and the hope I had for the latter stages of the season, when you started to see, see this deep, this offense really start to struggle was, you know what? I can see why Nick Sirianni, would defer play calling to Shane Steichen because Shane Steichen is a far better play caller than Nick Sirianni. So it's easier to have someone else in the building and go at, you know what, you do this, I'll be the CEO coach, we'll be good to go. But with Brian Johnson, I, I would like to at least hope that Nick Sirianni would be a better play caller than Brian Johnson if he decided to take that under, you know, under his wing. At the same time, to your point, especially when you have a guy like Matt Patricia, you don't have to worry about running your defense because it's not like he's coming in here very green. He knows what he's doing on that side of the football. So you don't have to worry about him. All the more reason for him to take over play call responsibilities. But if you're telling me he's right there to veto anything, then then it's just a, a ship waiting to sink. Well, he's got to. Now, he, he's not going to say that. You know, and coaches want to operate that. They want their coaches to coach, you know. But at the end of the day, if something's being talked about, if, if a call is being talked about, 
and that's not what that what the head coach likes, you know, he has the autonomy because he says, "Hey, my name is all over this. My fingerprints are all over this." He has the autonomy to 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 negate things. You think that he wasn't telling Jonathan Gannon not to blitz? You think that he wasn't telling Sean Desai you not to blitz here? If you don't think that those conversations are going on all the time, I've watched Buddy Ryan stand behind the offensive coordinator, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. Okay, I, I've seen it before. I've seen coaches do it before. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. But but it's situations like we were just talking about, you know, where there's this theory that makes me laugh when I see these people that chime in. Oh, you know, the NFL is rigged. You know, oh, the NFL is rigged. They got it's all set up. You know, the betting and whatnot. It's rigged. You know. And I'm like, man, you out your damn mind. These <laughs> these fools are out here trying to take my head off. Ain't nothing rigged about that. All right. But it makes you kind of wonder when you think about the Eagles are 98% on third or fourth and one. 98%. Do you understand the gravity of that percentage? 98%. But you got third and one, and you're going to turn around and hand the ball off. Why? Why? The, 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 that's the kind of dumb stuff that makes people believe that the NFL is rigged. When you're converting in 90, listen, the Eagles are converting on third down at 48%. They're number two in the, in the National Football League going into today's game. But you convert on third and fourth and ones at a 98% efficiency rate. But you're going to turn around and have your quarterback go backwards and hand the ball off to your running back to get one yard when you convert on your brotherly show 98% of the time. A if flat-footed running back. Yeah. I don't well, get it. Uh, let's go our game balls. <laughs> <laughs> game balls. Of course, you get fly with Colony. Colony pulls fly with Um, Game ball. This is an interesting uh, uh, selection here for game balls. You had a quarterback that made a great play to A.J. Brown that um, may have saved the game and at least delivered them uh, a victory. You had DeAndre Swift but running well. Um, where do you want to go with the game balls? I'll, I'll defer to you fellas first. Okay. Is that you want first crack? Go ahead. You know what, man? I, I'm just – I'm conflicted here because defensively, you know, you gave one of the worst – gave up – you know, 25 points to one of the worst teams in the National Football League. Yeah, but they so didn't can't... give up 25. They gave yeah, up they... a 14 yard drive and a, and a pick. They gave, up, right. they gave up 18. Okay. Yeah. You know, you, you got two quarterbacks over here that are in the 60s quarterback rating. Saquon had, you know, 23 carries for 80 yards. So obviously, I got to go over here, you know, on the Eagles side. 24 for 38, 301 yards, seven yards per one touchdown. One interception that you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna give to him with the slip and one sack, 85 rating. Um, eight, the Eagles won. You know, there's a side of me that wants to give it to DeAndre Swift. 20 carries. Can you believe that DeAndre Swift had 20 carries today? 15 in the second half. Um, I'm gonna give it to DeAndre Swift, and, and this is why. I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it to DeAndre Swift because. I believe that 20 carries for 92 yards, and if you would have gave him more than five carries in the first half, you'd have been over 100 yards, in my opinion. But he is showing, when given the opportunity, that he can be a vital piece to help Jalen play better quarterback. They're just so stubborn that they don't want to give him the ball in that manner. So um, that's my – that is my – um, my protest game ball more than anything else. <laughs> Money I think you're going gonna, gonna, gonna to go Kobe on me, but you didn't. So uh, <laughs> I respect I respect the DeAndre Swift. I thought um, about it, Mark. I'm going to give I'm going to do an obscure. This guy will never get a game ball, and sometimes I choose a guy who I don't think will ever get a game ball. That's Grant good. Calcaterra, first two catches of the season. <laughs> Of the season, my man, tight end. We didn't see Stall in the game, did we? <laughs> Calcaterra got the nod in there. They made yeah. two grabs. I'll give yeah. him the game ball. That one on that uh, little scramble there where the Kelsey snapped it over Jalen Hurts' head and they big found play. him. How about that? that big, big, big play. play. Big grab it was. by him. It absolutely was. Uh, I'm going to go with A.J. Brown uh, in this game, especially for his play in the fourth quarter. Now, DeAndre Swift, I think, is is the number one. Mike, I think you're right. Grant Cacatera, close second. 
But I go, the guy I go third here is A.J. Brown. 55 yards receiving, including that 32-yard receiving play where Jalen Hurts all of a sudden pulled something out of his hat where he was able to you know, climb the pocket in a rarity and then find A.J. Brown down the sideline to be able to get that first down on the third and 20. And that was his, uh, I think, one of three catches on that drive. And he was money. And in a clutch time where you needed to put the Giants – as close to as away as you could in this game, that was a situation where if they if they don't convert, they don't make those plays, he doesn't get open on that drive. You're looking at possibly not just talking about a moral loss, but an actual loss, which would obviously be worse. That's a good call. All right, let's look ahead. There are two games left. They'll both be at reasonable times. Next week, a 1 o'clock game, uh, Lincoln Financial Field and the Giants to be announced. I don't know what they're waiting to announce that, but <laughs> – uh, two games left that I believe the Eagles will win. We didn't okay, put that so game on the left qualms about being scared we're going to lose one of those games, right? So that means the two seed. And then we mix it all up again, Seth, and it's the playoffs, and we'll see how that works out. That's as far as I can go right now. Well, listen, I don't – deep down inside, I don't believe that they'll that they'll lose one of these games. You know, if there's a game that really scares me is it, is the Cardinals. You know, because they've got to keep Kyler Murray under control. Um, they're going to be able to put some points on the board. But I do believe that Jonathan Gannon is going to come in here and you know, kind of thumb his nose at, you know, the entirety of, of the Eagles organization and let them know how how this is how we should have probably been playing defense when I was here. And if you would have gave me the freedom, things would have been a lot different. Um so I get the sense that, you know, and, and I don't know, I, I'm, I got to do some digging this week. I want to see what Jalen's, what his, um, what his, what his completion percentage is, um, interception rate to turnover rate is, you know, under pressure situations. Um, because I get the sense the more and more that I watch games, teams are moving more and more in the directions of bringing pressure at Jalen. You know, and it serves two purposes because, you know, if you're doing it early in the game, you can kind of kill the running game along with speeding up the passing game because he really locks in the certain guys at certain points and times of the game. And it's like in the first half, it was Devonta, you know, and then there was like this window in the second half, Farzi, where he just decided, you know, I ain't looking at nobody, nobody but AJ, you know, and to me, that's just not efficient football. All four of your five of your receivers have to be in the equation. You can't just earmark one guy and lock in on him. And teams begin to see that. And when they begin to see that, when they find out who his target is going to be for that period of time, they're going to work to take that guy away and then come with pressure. So, um, listen, I, I think they'll win both games. But I'm telling you right now, that damn that that Cardinals game, the Cardinals game scares me to death. Um, and if Tyrod Taylor is going to continue to be the quarterback when they got to go back up there to the Giant Stadium, man, geez. <laughs> um, this but was my – All right, I get the, your laugh tells it all. But let's close it out with a laugh because we've got about a minute left. You know, we do this little the private chat on the side uh, here that we can communicate with each other as we're doing the show. And far as he put something out there, but we raised the concept of uh, Seth as Santa Claus a little <laughs> earlier in the show. And Forrest thinks that that would be a great thing to be Santa. And I, I can see it. Like, here, here would be Seth, and a, a little boy would come in and go, oh, Merry Christmas, little boy. Uh, what, what you want for Christmas? And, and the kid goes, hey, I want a race car. And Seth goes, you ain't getting no damn race car. How long did you get your mother this year, man? Get out. <laughs> you out your damn know, mind. You, you want to know something, man? I am, like, phenomenal with kids. Kids <laughs> love me. I don't know what y'all talking about. This is just the, this is the perception that y'all get because I got to check y'all's ass every single week with some of the nonsense that y'all be throwing out in these in these dodos in the in the comments. You ain't getting no <laughs> race car, little boy. Get me out of my face. <laughs> oh, right, man, listen, I'll be like, I've been right a good. Now. I've been a good little boy. I've been a good little boy, and he's got a list of things like misreads you had in class and stuff like that. Absolutely. I'd be like, man, oh, come man. on. Let's, let's, Fellas, have a great rest I'll of the holiday. I'll take you for a ride in my race car, man. Come on. All right, sounds good. <laughs> We'll be at you next week at a reasonable time as the Eagles play the Arizona Cardinals, Lincoln Financial Field. Until then, I'm Mike Missinelli for Seth Joyner, Mark Farzana, Bill Calarula, and Kayla Santiago. 
uh, and everybody who participates in the show, the crew work tonight. Uh, happy Christmas to them. We will see you next week. Two games left in this season and the playoffs. So we'll at least have three post-game shows, folks. At least three. And we'll yeah, see me. you next week. Good night, everybody. Merry Christmas, guys. Score and save at Southeastern PA in Delaware with Colony Pools this football season. And let the experts close your pool with a custom Merlin safety cover in green for the birds. And if you join our winter watch team, we'll give you another 20% off and Colony Pools will handle it all. Keep your tiles on your pool, not in your pool. Fly with Colony right now, birds fans. Visit flywithcolony.com.